This is something that I, I do a lot of public education on social media and some lectures here at Stanford. I don't think I've ever really talked about how our, we breathe controls our heart rate. We want to learn to move up and down that continuum where we are in control. So we already talked about the use of light in the visual system. How can we control our level of alertness using breathing? This is a beautiful MRI, not from my lab, of the diaphragm, the skeletal muscle that lies below our heart and moves our lungs. So that's a very direct and simple an important relationship between how we breathe and our level of alertness and calmness. And it doesn't involve anything esoteric. It doesn't involve any kind of breath work per se. But if you watch the diaphragm, the diaphragm moves up and down. And what this means, and the, those with the medical background will appreciate this, when we inhale, our diaphragm moves down because the lungs expand, which creates more space for our heart blood flows a little bit more slowly through the heart, and then the brain sends a signal to speed up our heart rate. The simple way to translate this is if you want your heart rate to increase, if you want to be more alert, you should inhale more and longer than you exhale. Now that immediately says that for somebody that's stressed, the last thing you wanna tell them is to take a deep breath. The other thing you don't wanna tell them is to calm down because it's very hard to, to control the mind with the mind. What we're about to talk about is using the mind to control the body and then the body to control the mind and then to take control of the reciprocal relationship between the two. So if you wanna be more alert, inhale more than you exhale, both deeper and longer for this simple and basic relationship between the movement of the diaphragm, the lungs, the heart and neural signals from the brain. The opposite is also true. When we exhale, our diaphragm moves up in our body cavity that creates less space for the heart. Blood flows more quickly through the heart and the brain sends a signal to slow down heart rate. So if you want to relax, extend your exhales relative to your inhales and make the exhales, it's, it's sort of hard to think about making exhales deeper, but extend them. For those of you that wanna know, this is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Arrhythmia always sounds bad, but heart rate variability is good. Heart rate variability signals to us that that seesaw isn't locked in one position for too much of the waking day. So this is breathing control of heart rate variability. The other thing that is a very useful tool, besides just remembering inhales to make me more alert and exhales to make me calmer, is this notion of physiological size. This is a phenomenon that was discovered in the 30s, but has received a lot of experimental attention in recent years by my colleague, Mark Krasnow here at Stanford, as well as Jack Feldman's group at UCLA and their former student, Kevin Yackel, now at UCSF. Physiological sides are a pattern of breathing that all animals, including humans, engage in spontaneously when carbon dioxide gets too high in our system. Our trigger to breathe and a big aspect of the stress response is not getting enough oxygen and having too much carbon dioxide build up in our bloodstream and lungs. So there's a pattern of breathing that we all do in sleep and in conditions of claustrophobia that looks like this. It's inhale, inhale, then exhale. Inhale, inhale, then exhale. And what this does is it maximally inflates these little sacs in the lungs. Our lungs aren't two big bags of air. Our lungs are actually millions of little sacs that allow us a big increase in the surface area of our lungs. You'll see the blood vessels innervate these little sacs. And when we do a double inhale followed by an exhale, we maximally offload the carbon dioxide. Now this isn't some hack or trick. Animals, and we do this in sleep, we do it in claustrophobic environments, and you'll see that children and adults do this after sobbing when they need to catch their breath. The double inhale reinflates the collapsed, what they're called alveoli of the lungs. Like you would blow up a balloon in a kid's party, you're gonna give one push and then another one to maximally inhale them and then offload the carbon dioxide. Our lab is starting to explore this with David Spiegel's lab. What I can say is that to my knowledge, this is the fastest way to de-stress oneself using a purely mechanical, non-cognitive tool. And it, as far as I know, it's faster than any cognitive tool. Although some people are very good at calming themselves, a double inhale followed by exhale for the reasons described here can offload carbon dioxide. You just repeat it two or three times and then you find that the, the level of arousal will quickly drop for a lot of reasons, carbon dioxide offload, et cetera. So inhale, inhale, exhale equals maximum offload of CO2. Now, conditions of fasting, a lot of people these days are excited about intermittent fasting. There's some studies pro, there's some studies against. We have experts at Stanford um, who work on these issues as well as, um, as others. When we are in a fasted state, 
we tend to have more alertness than we are when we're fed. And that's why the parasympathetic nervous system is also called the rest and digest system. Now, it doesn't matter what you eat. If your gut is full of food, if I eat nine ribeye steaks, well, that would be, well, eight ribeye steaks, let's say, um, or eight pounds of broccoli and my gut is fully distended, a lot of blood is gonna be diverted there and away from the other tissues of the body, including my brain, and I'm gonna be sleepy regardless of what I eat. So it's volume of food, there's a blood sugar relationship, and then there's timing of food intake. I will say this, regular, relatively, not neurotically, controlled, but regular meal timing, even if you're intermittent fasting. So for instance, if you're a lunch and dinner person or a breakfast dinner person or breakfast, lunch and dinner, or whatever it is, those, those mechanisms that govern our alertness are tied to our food intake. Light is the most powerful zeitgeber, as we call it, timekeeper, but the timing of food intake, exercise and light combine to tell our autonomic nervous system when we should be awake and alert. A simple way to do this is if you have trouble waking up early, light in your eyes early during the day, exercise early in the day, and believe it or not, food intake early in the day will, in a short period of time, shift your autonomic nervous system towards early wake up time, whether or not it's pleasant to do those things that time of day or not. Likewise, doing those later in the day will shift you towards later. But basically when blood sugar is low, we tend to secrete molecules in our, in our brain and bloodstream that promote agitation, wakefulness, and the pursuit of food, but that can be diverted, that alertness and attention can be diverted to cognitive things. Some people work better fasted. Some people can't work at all when they're when they're not fed. So um, it's highly individual, but there's a kind of a core logic, which is the hungrier you are, the more you're alert you're going to be and able to focus. But at some point that focus will become all about food.